excited to be with you tonight. I'm glad that you're here. If you've got your Bible, open to the book of Matthew in chapter 9. That's what we're going to study tonight. Uh, I, I, I'm so thankful that you're here. I, I, so many of you have been in my heart for years. You, you blessed me so very long ago, and, and I thank you for that. And you've been a blessing to me in a lot of ways since, and I appreciate that so much as well. Um, I'd like to talk a lot about that, but I, I know we're here to talk about the Bible, and I really want to talk about that too. Tonight we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 9, and I'll tell you that this is, this is an important lesson. This is an important message. And, and like I told you the other night, it's not because it's my sermon. I'm not going to give you a lot of um, application of Matthew chapter 9. I really think the power of the gospel and the power of God's word is when you just simply see what Matthew is trying to say. That communicates God's message, and it, will, it is powerful to change lives. I, I confess to you that, that it, has, it has changed the way that I look at the world. It has changed the way that I look at, at, at God's people. It's, the way, it, it's changed the way that I look at myself. This is a powerful message. It will change your lives when you just simply hear what God is saying through Matthew. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at uh, when John the Baptist sends two of his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the expected one or should we look for somebody else? And I, and I want to ponder the question, what should we do when Jesus isn't what we think he ought to be? When Jesus isn't what we expect? What do we do with disappointments? What do we do when we become Christians and we have these high hopes of, and expectations of how things are going to be and then it doesn't work out that way? What do we do then? I, again, I, that's a life-changing message. And then on Wednesday night, Wednesday night we're going to talk about how James and John come to Jesus and they want Jesus to make one of them his left lieutenant and one of them his right lieutenant. And, 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 and we want to do big things for Jesus. I want to do big things for Jesus, don't you? I want to do big things for Jesus. What does that look like? What does it look like to really be committed to Jesus? Well, I think it's an important question. I think it's an important message that Matthew's communicating to us. And again, it's not the application. It's not my sermon. It's what Matthew is saying. This is the power of God to change people's lives. And so we want to talk tonight, we want to talk a little bit tonight about Matthew chapter 9. And I, I want to begin with this kind of question. Many people would associate Jesus with compassion. If we go out here into the streets, if we go around here to Somerset, we go all the way out into the county, Pulaski County, and we ask people here in Kentucky or up in Illinois where I live now, if we ask people throughout the country of the United States, is Jesus compassionate? They're all going to admit, most people are going to admit, unless they're just staunchly opposed to religion or to spirituality or to Christianity in general, most people are going to admit, yes, Jesus is a man of compassion. That's the way that we envision him. That's the way that, the, that our, our minds are. Even non-religious people, even non-church-going people, even people that are down on organized religion would see Jesus as a man of compassion. But would they make that same association with church people? Now listen, we are Jesus' disciples. We are to model Him, to be like Him, to speak like Him, to walk like Him, to act and behave like Him, to be like Him, to represent Him. Jesus, the world even sees, is a man of compassion. But there's something different when they look at His disciples. What's the issue? What's the problem? Why don't they associate church people in the same way that they associate the teacher, in the same way that they associate Jesus, our Lord, our Master? I've often heard people, and maybe you've heard this as well, I've often heard people say that Christians are some of the cruelest people. And let me tell you, I'm, I can personally attest to this. Now, I also believe that church people, Christians, my brothers and sisters and disciples of Jesus Christ can, some, can be some of the most caring and compassionate and wonderful people. They can be some of the greatest support that you will ever have in your life. But I'd be dishonest if I didn't also admit that some of the people that we worship with, some of the people that go to church on Sundays, 
can truly be the biggest hurdles and the biggest obstacles to heaven. They can be cruel. They can, they, they can, they can, they can be being spirited. They can be anything but compassionate. And it is a problem for a number of people. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 9. Now there are, like we talked about yesterday, uh, in chapters uh, 17, 18, and 19, there are a lot of, it seems, unrelated events. In those chapters, also here in Matthew chapter 9, there seems to be a lot of unrelated events. There's a lot of miracles that Jesus is performing here. But there is a central theme. And this is just, this is just a, a, a bit of information about, I think, how to do Bible study. Sometimes we'll look at one miracle. Jesus, in, in here, Jesus will call Matthew and he, uh, he, heals, he heal, heals Jairus' daughter. And so we'll study that little portion of Scripture. And, and I think that that's fine to do. We can study that one portion of Scripture and we can, we can develop a message out of that or we could do a Bible study out of that. There, there's, there's, there, there, there's, there's value in doing it. But it's not an isolated text. It's put, Matthew puts that in connection with the other things around it for a reason, and we ought to spend a little bit of time asking, why does it fit here? And that's what we're going to do tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 9. There are three times, three times as you read down through Matthew chapter 9, three times where Jesus, uh, where, 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 where Jesus is associated with compassion or mercy. Uh, the, the, the wording is different, but the theme is the same. Look at this, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, where Jesus says, I desire compassion. He's quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Hosea. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And then in verse 27, in verse 27, the, the two blind men call out to, da, uh, out to Jesus and say, Have mercy on us, son of David. And then down near the end of the chapter in verse 36, where Jesus looks at the people and he felt compassion for them because they were dis distressed and dis uh, dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So three times here we have mercy or we have compassion. That is the theme. That's the central message that runs through all of these miracles that Jesus is performing. Maybe... Maybe we church folks, maybe we people that are his disciples, maybe we should think seriously about this chapter and about what Matthew is trying to communicate to us. So the first thing that we notice here in Matthew chapter 9, or at least down by verse 9, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, that's where we're going to begin at least tonight. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, this is where Jesus calls Matthew the tax collector. That's the first event that we're going to notice tonight. Jesus calls Matthew the tax collector. And so here's what the Bible says. This is Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9 and verse 10. As Jesus went on from there, he saw the man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. So maybe you know something a little bit about the tax collectors, the publicans of the New Testament time. These people are not only viewed as traitors to their own people. They work for another uh, government. They work for the Roman government. They work for our enemies. They're traitors to our people. They're traitors to the Jewish people. But they're also thieves. That's the way that they're viewed. And here is Matthew and... He is, notice what? Notice he is seated. He's seated and he's actively doing this despised work. The things that people hate so very much about tax collectors, he's actively doing them. It's not his reputation. It's what they see him doing right then in that moment. And Jesus calls him, follow me. Now, here's a question. How many... How many good and upright, how many good and upright Jews saw Jesus call Matthew, seated in the tax collector's booth, doing this despised work, a traitor to his people and probably a thief too, and Jesus, this supposed holy person, calls him to be a disciple. Matthew gets up and Matthew follows him. 
You know, I th there, there's this... There's this issue that we have with tolerance. You've, you've probably heard people talk about tolerance and how we need to be a tolerant society. There's a misunderstanding of tolerance. What does it mean to be tolerant? What does it mean to be tolerant? Does it mean that we, we never tell somebody that they're doing wrong? D does it mean that we, that we never rebuke sin? Well, of course not. Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't hold back from rebuking sin. What does it mean to be tolerant? It's misunderstood today, but what does it mean? I think it, mean, it, means, it means not rubbing somebody's nose in their past mistakes. Of course, none of us would have done this, but when you were in grade school, did, did any of your classmates, did, did they ever have an accident in school? Uh, may, may, maybe somebody ate too much at lunch and they threw up. Maybe they just weren't feeling well and they threw up and they threw up all over their desk or they threw up there in the cafeteria or they just threw up someplace. Maybe it was some other kind of accident, but something like that that was going to be memorable. As soon as I mentioned that, if anybody had that experience, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You suppose they're embarrassed by that? You suppose they go back to their 10-year anniversary, their 10-year reunion, and they're still the, the barfing kid. It was not me, I promise. <laughs> I avoided all of my reunions. <laughs> That's not compassionate, is it? Forever and ever and ever, it doesn't matter how long they live, they will never be able to live that down. That one mistake, they'll never be able to shed that reputation. You suppose we ever do that with our brothers and sisters in Christ? You ever suppose we might do that with other people that we worship with? We just never let the past go. Now, now there's, there's one other piece to this that I think we need to understand. Was Matthew a thief? Was Matthew a traitor? I don't know. It does look like he's a traitor. I'd probably feel all kinds of ways about it if I was another Jew and Matthew's taxing me for people that are oppressing me. I'd probably have some strong feelings about that. I'd be inclined to also think bad things about him like he's probably stealing from us too. But whatever he was, and this is really important to understand about compassion and tolerance, whatever he was, when Jesus calls him, Matthew gets up and follows him. He leaves the tax collector booth behind. That is really key to tolerance. That's really key to compassion. Whatever the person was in the past, it's not what they are now. Now, a person that wants to remain in their sins, I, I don't think we overlook that. And so then Jesus teaches this lesson on compassion. Read on with me a little bit further. This is verse 11 now. So Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are those who are sick. And, and I just want to highlight that last verse for just a moment. Uh, Jesus does not overlook their sins. He acknowledges that they are sick. They need help. They need healing. They need correction. He's not overlooking their sin and saying, it's okay, whatever you're doing, it's fine with me. He acknowledges that they're sick. But he quotes then from the book of Hosea. If you open your Bibles to the book of Hosea, Hosea is, of course, one of the minor prophets. It's the first of the minor prophets. Hosea, this is chapter 6. And Hosea has such an interesting story. God calls him to go and marry a woman. And depending on your translation, I think the King James says whoredom. Um, some people have the, 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 the view that God commanded him to to go out and marry a prostitute. I don't think that that's the case. I, I, I think that the idea here, God calls Hosea to go and marry a woman 
of her culture and her age. She fits within her society. Of course, that kind of worldly woman then cheats on him, runs off a number of times. He has a number of children, and by the last few children, he's not even sure that these children belong to him. Notice chapter 6. It's all, it's all a, a, a picture of God's relationship with Israel. In Hosea chapter 6, the people speak. This is, this is the people of Israel. And the people of Israel say, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us. But He will heal us. He has wounded us. But He will bind up our wounds. Now, just like Gomer had cheated on Hosea and ran off and left him behind, uh, and then she becomes destitute and in all kinds of trouble, and God calls on Hosea to go and redeem her and bring her back, uh, to restore her once again. So also God is compassionate and merciful to his people. Over and over and over he is compassionate and merciful. And so the people are speaking now, and the people are acknowledging God's compassion and mercy. Come let us return to the Lord. Let's go back to God. He, uh, he has punished us, he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bind us up. He will revive us after two days. On the third day he will raise us up so that we can live in his presence. Let us, let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. And he will come to us like rain, like, the shower, uh, like spring showers, like the water uh, uh, that water the land. Now verse 4, God responds to what the people have just said. What am I to do with you, Ephraim? What am I to do with you, Judah? Do you hear frustration in God's voice here? Why would he be frustrated? It is. It, I ask you the question. I'll, I'll just. He is frustrated. What am I to do with you? We talked about children on Sunday morning. You ever get frustrated with your kids? How many times have I told you? What am I to do with you? God's frustrated with them. Well, why is he frustrated with them? Didn't they just say the things that they're supposed to say? We will return to the Lord. Yes, God has punished us, but God will heal us. God is always faithful. God will restore us. Why is he frustrated with them? Uh, maybe it's because they're just going through the motions. We, 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 we go out, we do what we want to do on Saturday. We come to church on Sunday and we say, God, forgive us. And then on Monday, we go back out, we do what we want to again until Saturday night, and we come to church on Sunday morning. God, forgive us once again. You remember that passage in the book of 1 uh, Timothy where Paul calls on men to pray? And, and what does he say about them praying? Lifting up holy hands. Lifting up holy hands. And the way I picture that is, uh, when I was a boy, sometimes mom would tell Kevin and me, my brothers, we, we would have to go in and we'd have to wash up. You know, we'd have to wash up for supper. And so we'd go in and we'd have to wash our hands. And sometimes, you go, because moms are, moms are perspective, or moms are, moms, are, moms are watchful this way, and she'll ask you, did, did you really wash your hands? I didn't hear the water running. Did you really wash your hands? Did you use soap? And then she would want to look at our hands, and we'd have to show her, our hands. Why? To see if there's any dirt on them. Lifting up holy hands. God wants to see if your hands are clean. Or do you have blood on them? You've been out here living a wild life all through the week and then you come on Sunday with dirty hands and you want to pray to God. God's frustrated with the people of Israel. They are the ones who are abusive here in the New Testament, these are the very people. They need compassion themselves, but they have none for anybody else. They need compassion. That's why Jesus quotes here from the book of Hosea. Because the very people that are condemning him for eating with these sinners are sinners themselves. But too hypocritical to realize it. Those who needed God's compassion had none for other people. God forbid that we should be like that. God forbid that we should be like that. I need God's mercy. I need God's compassion. I don't want to continue living in the sin. I want to put that in the past. I want to be free of that. 
I acknowledge that it's wrong. I don't want to live like that anymore. God set me free from this. But if I want that kind of compassion for myself, then I have to be willing to acknowledge compassion for other people who also want to put their sin in the past as well. And so Jesus illustrates the point once again in the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 9, this time verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one, no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. What's Jesus talking about here? When you study this passage, do not get sidetracked into a discussion about whether Jesus is permitting alcohol or not. That, that might be a discussion that we ought to have, but, but don't get sidetracked on this passage. What's this passage doing in this place in Matthew? Jesus is using this as an illustration of the point he just made about compassion. If I need compassion, then I need to be compassionate to my neighbor. It's an illustration of the point. What is the appropriate patch for an old garment? What is the appropriate, uh, the, appropriate the, the right container for new wine? And what is the appropriate attitude towards those that are weak and broken and sinful? What is the right way to be? That's what this is illustrating. And so then, as the chapter unfolds, again, all of these things are related and it has this central theme of compassion that runs all the way through it. Matthew relates for us a multitude of different examples of Jesus' compassion. And the first one we read about is Jairus' daughter. The, the synagogue official is the way that he's described here in the book of Matthew. And it's broken up too. Notice this. It's broken up, right? The woman with the hemorrhage is in between. Matthew chapter 9. Let's read these verses together. Matthew chapter 9 verse 18 and 19. Notice that we're just working right down through the chapter. 18 and 19, while he was saying these things to them, so he's just illustrated the point about compassion, what is the right way to be, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, now let me pause there for just a moment. Who is it that's coming? A synagogue official. Who is it that was just criticizing Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners? Who is it that was just criticizing Jesus for eating with those kind of people? I may not know them personally, but I know that kind. You've heard language like that before, haven't you? Those kind of people. Who is it that needs Jesus' help now? A synagogue official. Who is it that just criticized Jesus for eating with those kind of people? Back in verse 11, when a Pharisee saw this, they said to his disciples, those kind of people. Uh, Jesus might just as well say to Jairus when he's in need, well, your kind of people, I don't care about you individually, but your kind of people didn't have anything good to say about me just a moment ago. Why should I help you now? A synagogue official comes to Jesus, bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And then it breaks off for a moment and picks up again in verse 23. When Jesus came to the official's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. And he said, leave for the girl has not died but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been set out, he entered and took her by the hand and the girl got up and the news spread throughout all the land. 
Yeah, this is the man, this is the kind of man. Maybe not this individual, but his kind of people had just criticized Jesus for eating with a certain kind of people. See how prejudice works? But what is the appropriate response? Even if this man... Even if this particular synagogue official was one of the very people who was criticizing Jesus for going to Matthew's house, even if that were the case, when he comes to Jesus now, what is the appropriate response? Now, I know that if you go to the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 8, the same story is related for us. And Luke, being the physician, Luke is very detailed about this, and Luke gives us the information that she was dying. And Matthew tells us that the girl was dead. Well, actually, Matthew doesn't tell us that the girl was dead. Some people see this as a contradiction between the Gospels. This isn't a contradiction. Luke tells us the actual state of the girl, that she was dying. Matthew tells us not the state of the girl, but what the Father says about her. And I would even argue the case that the dad, and he is, that's what he is, he's a dad. He's a dad with a little girl that's 12 years old. It doesn't matter to him if she's dead or she's dying. He's desperate. He's desperate. And when you're desperate, do you get technical about, about the details? I don't. I'm likely to say anything. Here's a man that perhaps he is the very kind of person that wouldn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. He would have never been seen with Jesus before, but he has no place to turn. His daughter, his 12 year old little girl, his baby girl. You can imagine all the memories of that little girl growing up those last 12 years. You can imagine all of those memories that are just running through his mind at that very moment. And he doesn't have anywhere else to turn. He has no place to go. He has nobody that can help him. And there's Jesus, and he comes running to Jesus, and he pleads with Jesus, and he begs Jesus, Jesus, just come and help me. I don't know what else to do. She's probably dead already. But come anyway. Now, when a man comes to you like that and he's broken down, what do you do? You turn your back on him now? What's the appropriate response? You can hear all the pain and the fear and the desperation in these words. What is the appropriate response when he comes to you now? In between these verses is another miracle and another woman. Read again with me, if you will. This is, again, Matthew chapter 9 and now verse 20. So we'll back up just a little bit. We'll pick up this story that, that, that's interwoven here. So we have Jairus. We have the synagogue official who perhaps might have been the very kind of people that would have rejected Jesus a moment ago, but now he's desperate and he's in need of Jesus and he comes pleading to Jesus in all seriousness. He's pleading with Jesus for help. And in between this, another woman comes to Jesus. Verse 20, And a woman who had been suffering with a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. I don't want to bother him. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, want to, I don't want to make a scene. If I can just get close enough to him, I'll be well. But Jesus turning and seeing her said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once the woman was made well. You see what's going on here? Th think, about, think about what's just been happening. Think about what's just taking place. And the way Jesus speaks to the way that Jesus speaks to her here. So think about this woman for just a moment as you're, as you're pondering all of these things, putting all these things together in your mind. Here's a woman, Matthew tells us that she's been suffering with this bleeding for 12 years. 
do you suppose that's something that she goes around and talks to all of her neighbors about? You suppose that might be one of those things that she'd like to keep private? How weak do you suppose she might be if this has been ongoing for 12 years? How much strength do you think, think it took for her to push her way through the crowd to get to Jesus just to touch his cloak? Now, uh, she's been suffering with this for 12 years. Um, come back to that in just a moment. Uh, she'd been suffering with this. What does Jesus call her? Now, uh, Mark, Mark and Luke are, are specific about this. She suffered with, for this with 12, for 12 years, and the girl that Jesus raises from the dead is 12 years as old as well. And I think there's some significance to the number 12. But what does Jesus call her? What does Jesus call her? Look at this again. Look at verse 22. Jesus turning and seeing her says to her daughter, you suppose she might have even been older than Jesus? I suspect she was older than Jesus. Perhaps more than a decade or two older than Jesus. And Jesus turns to her and says, Daughter, I don't think that's by accident. What, what had just happened? Here comes a man desperate desperate coming to Jesus because his daughter, his little baby girl, is dying. Now, if a synagogue official can feel for his daughter, why can't God feel compassion, mercy, and love for his daughter? She may be an old woman that nobody pays any attention to, but I'll tell you what, that's God's little girl. Some of you dads out here, what would you do for your little girl? What would you do for your little girl? Uh, maybe a better question is, what wouldn't you do for your little girl? Your 12-year-old little baby. Now, if a synagogue official can feel all kinds of compassion and mercy and love, for his little girl, why shouldn't God feel that way for his little girl? Because she may be old now, but she's still his little girl. I've told my daughters that it doesn't matter how old they get, I would love for them to come to my house and they can climb up in my lap and we'll sit and read like we used to do. I really kind of hope I really do kind of hope that someday when they're 40 or 50, they'll come and sit on this old man's lap and let me rock them one last time. Because they're still going to be my little girl. The story goes on. And Jesus interacts with two blind men. Two blind men. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 now. And Jesus went on from there... Two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And he entered the house, and the blind man came up to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him, throughout the land. How could they not? How could they not? How could they not tell people what Jesus had done for them? And remember, again, remember the way that these blind men are saw by everybody else in the world. Everybody else in the world sees that people who have bad things happen to them are bad people. You remember that passage in John chapter 9 about another blind person? The disciples, Jesus' own disciples come to him and ask, Did this man sin or his parents that he should be born blind? Bad things happen to you because you do bad things. And so here are two men that are blind. Something bad has happened to them. 
So obviously, they're sinners. They must have done something bad. That's the way the seeing world sees them. You ever feel like the seeing world sees you wrongly? And Jesus reaches out to these perceived wicked persons with compassion and mercy. And then one more story. There's a demon-possessed man. Matthew chapter 9, again in verse 32 this time. Verse 32, we just continue on reading down through the text. I'm telling you, this is Matthew's sermon. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying... Jesus casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Now listen, if you've missed the point up until this, don't miss it any longer. You see the spiritual connection that's being made in all of this? Jesus has mercy on the dying and on the weak, on the blind, and even those that are literally caught by the devil. You see the spiritual connection, right? And what happens next? An inappropriate. Jesus begins with an appropriate response. And here we have an example of an inappropriate response by the self-righteous. Verse 34 once again. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. I'm going to tell you, it's not just the miracles. You've got to get this last, these last few verses in here. This is where the point is made. Isn't it strange that the, the spiritual leaders, here are the people that are supposed to be representing God. Representing the compassionate Father of the universe. Isn't it strange that the spiritual leaders, the church people, see compassion not just as bad, but a work of the devil? They're not just against it, they're really against it. That's demonic. Compassion? Mercy? Demonic? And Jesus laments. Jesus laments. Verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Their spiritual leaders... The scribes and the Pharisees should have felt compassion. They only see demonic works. Jesus sees, com feels compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited. How could they not be dispirited when those that should build them up see them this way? They're beat down and they're broken because of the church people that they're around. They were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. I've got one last slide. Notice the last two verses. It's a prayer. It's a prayer. It's a simple prayer. God, please send out workers. Verse 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray, beseech, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Why are there so few workers? Now, 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 
let me just caution you just, just briefly. He's not saying we need more preachers. I'm thankful to be a gospel preacher. We do need more gospel preachers. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not lamenting how few preachers there are. He's not even lamenting how few church people there are. He's praying for workers. But what kind of workers are they? What kind of workers are they? Just to take us out of Matthew for just a moment, in John chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And do you remember the contrast that he's making? The good shepherd as opposed to the hired man. They both look the same and they both deal with sheep, but they're really different, aren't they? What kind of workers is Jesus asking for? He's not asking for more preachers. What kind of workers is he asking for? He's asking for people that have compassion for the lost. He's looking for people that have mercy on those that are broken, that need a redeemer. He's looking for more people like himself. Paul, when he writes to the Philippians, he describes Timothy and he says, I have no one, and the New American Standard, I love the New American Standard in the way that it phrases this, I have no one of kindred spirit. I don't have anybody else that has a spirit like mine in your interests. There's plenty of other preachers. Paul's even already talked about it in the book of Philippians. Most of them are self-interested. I need somebody like Timothy. I need somebody like Epaphroditus. We need people that are disciples of Jesus in truth and in compassion. Listen, the world is still filled with the distressed and the downcast. You don't have to walk very far down the street to find people that are dispirited, that are broken, that are hurting. And so if we're going to go out there and we're going to share the message of Jesus Christ with them, we need to make sure that we share the message of compassion with them at the same time. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you to be disciples of Jesus. Now, if there's anyone here tonight that's broken and that's hurting, Jesus can forgive. Jesus can build you up. Let's be His kind of people. Repent of your sins. Confess, his, uh, conf confess that He is King of, of this world and King of your life. Be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins and walk with Him as a disciple hereafter. Come while we stand and sing.